This is Duke University. Welcome to another Fuqua Faculty Conversation. I'm Ronnie Chatterjee. I think I know most of you watching out there, but in case you don't know me, I've been at Fuqua since 2006. I've taught the core strategy class in the GEMBA, the CCMBA, and the daytime program. I've also had the great opportunity to teach students in WEMBA and our Duke Goethe program. And I hope that many of you are out there watching this video. It's really been a pleasure over the last eight years at Fuqua to get to know so many of you. And what I often found is, as much as I get to know you during our classes, I keep in touch with so many of you outside of class and after class, and that's where a lot of the learning gets done. Your business school experience might just be 18 months or two years, depending on which program you're in, but hopefully the relationships at Fuqua that you developed are things that last a lifetime. For me, as a faculty member, that's been certainly true with students. Now, for those of you who had me early on in 2006 and 2007, a lot's changed in my life. I've gone to Washington, D.C. and come back. I've been married now, I'm still married, uh, and have a young daughter who's about two years old and another one on the way. So I've gone from a bachelor professor to now a married guy with a kid and another one on the way. But my research interests are in the same direction, which is around entrepreneurship and innovation. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I want to just lay some ground rules for this session. This is a really exciting format, and I'm excited to be participating in it um, as, I think, the 15th faculty member to do one of these. Some questions have been submitted in advance by email. I have those questions in front of me, so if you see me looking down at the paper, you'll know why I'm doing that. I've reviewed a few of these before the session, and I'll try to address them uh, as they come in. You can also submit questions during the session. I hope that as you're watching, some questions will get sparked in your head. You'll want to send them to me, and I can answer those. You can send those via Twitter to our Fuqua alumni hashtag. You can also find me on Twitter at, at Aaron Chatterjee. That's A-A-R-O-N-C-H-A-T-T-E-R-J-I. Or as we said, the Fuqua alumni hashtag, no space. We're planning to do a 45-minute session, but if there's a lot of interest and more questions, I've blocked off the whole hour, uh, and the team will stay here and we'll answer all the questions that come our way. So I hope you're uh, ready for a fun session on some really interesting and sometimes controversial topics. Um, and why don't I get started, and I'll wait for your questions. So I want to kick off this session by talking a little bit about what I've been up to in terms of my research, teaching, and service. At that point, I'll review some of the items that we talked about in the pre-recorded video. The multimedia team here at Fuqua did a fantastic job with the video, and I hope you got a chance to watch it. But in case you did it, just like the pre-reading assignments that you sometimes forgot to do uh, in class, hopefully I'll catch you up with some few high-level uh, highlights. So most of my research over the last eight years has been on the topic of startups and entrepreneurs. What I've been interested in is who founds new companies, what kinds of prior experience and backgrounds they have, and what are the strategies that make them most successful. You know, Entrepreneurship is a hard thing to be an academic writing about. I publish mostly in academic journals for other academics. But for things like entrepreneurship, you may be asking, how much can we really learn from research? How much can we even really learn in the classroom? Isn't entrepreneurship like so many other things where you just learn by doing it? You know, I've heard that criticism a lot about the field of entrepreneurship and research in that area. And I actually agree with a large part of that. Some part of entrepreneurship is experiential. You have to be doing it to actually figure out what the challenges are. And that's why in addition to my research, I've actually been working on some outside projects that you'll hear about later in education and healthcare. I've learned a lot from those experiences that are actually flowing back into my research. But let me make a plug for research as well, because I do spend a lot of time on that part of the job, more time than anything else. And here's why I think it's valuable. You know, when we invite entrepreneurs to come speak at Duke, which we do quite often, they often give inspirational speeches that help students plot their next career move or think about great things they can achieve. What's great about war stories of success is that they can inspire you to do great things. What's not as good about war stories about success is they're just about success. Academics like me try to take an unbiased view of entrepreneurship and study an entire population or at least a highly representative sample of entrepreneurs and try to figure out what drives success in that population. Think about it this way. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, do you only want to know the successful outcomes, or would you rather know what the average outcome is? Now, like you, none of us like to think that we're average, and you shouldn't shoot for mediocrity. But in terms of my own career, when I think about embarking on a new endeavor, I always want to know what the average outcome is. Most small businesses fail within five years. Most entrepreneurial ventures are not successful. It'd be good to understand that data point to begin with and understand some of the reasons why. And that's the second thing about academic research in this area that I think is pretty useful understanding what causes what. 
you know, not so many of us are self-aware enough to know why we're successful. So when you ask a successful person, what's the secret to your success? They often say something generic like, well, I just worked harder than everybody else, or I surrounded myself with great people. That's often true, but I find those answers lacking. What we try to do in research is understand what causes what. And we find that when you look at causal inference, you often find the role of environment or even luck matter a lot more than we like to think. So as great as war stories are and experience is, research can hopefully teach us something as well. So I hope that's kind of a, uh, a motivation for why I think entrepreneurship research has something to be. Now, the other important part of the puzzle, aside from entrepreneurship and practical experience, is working on public policy. One of the things that a lot of startups, I think, ignore is the role policy can play on their venture. You look at what's happening in the Supreme Court right now, dealing with the broadcasters and some disruptive innovation that may change their business model. You see that across several sectors where new entrants right, find that they often have public policy barriers that make their business model more tricky. Pandora is another example in the music business. So what I tried to do when I went to Washington, D.C. is understand how public policy impacts entrepreneurs and startups. In 2010, 2011, I was granted leave by Fuqua and Duke to serve at the White House Council of Economic Advisors for President Obama. It wasn't a political position, but it was a part of an economic think tank to help inform the president and his decision makers. I found the experience to be fascinating. Trying to think about how policy works in the real world to impact entrepreneurs was another pillar of the foundation I want to build to understand this general phenomenon. So taking my research, my teaching, my outside work, and my policy experience together, I'm starting to generate new insights about entrepreneurship and innovation. And that's how I came to the topic today on education and healthcare. The pre-recorded video that you saw earlier is all about how we're going to bend the cost curve in ed and meds. Let me tell you how I came to think about this. When I was in Washington, I realized that two of the greatest challenges facing the United States are in reforming our education and our healthcare system. We're spending lots of money, but we're not getting great results. And what was interesting to me is how much attention was focused in Washington on these two issues. We were all trying to find ways at the federal and later the state level to reduce costs without decreasing value, and in some cases reducing costs and increasing value. For most people I spoke with, the answer to that question, that puzzle of how to get more and spending less, was through technology. Now, if you've been and done the MBA at Fuqua, you know the words about disruptive innovation and the work of Clay Christensen and others. It's been a powerful lens to view the economy. Disruptive innovation comes in the form of new startups or even established companies and new divisions in established companies coming up with new ideas that change the rules of the game and change the competitive landscape. Disruptive innovation and technological innovation have changed entire industries. As I said in the video, we don't make cars the same way we did in the early part of the 20th century. You don't buy an airline ticket using a travel agent and you probably don't stand in line to see the teller at the bank. All those activities and industries have been radically shifted because of technological innovation and in some cases disruption. Lately, I've seen in business schools and policy schools and government talks around the country that people are seeking to disrupt education and healthcare in the same way. The idealist in me says, that's a great idea. We should be thinking about ways to reform these systems from the bottom up. But the pragmatist in me has led to a lot of questions. How are we going to disrupt these huge systems? And what kinds of technologies are actually going to bend the cost curve and increase value? Through my research, I've found there's lots of examples of great apps that fail in the classroom or fantastic health applications that don't deliver good outcomes to patients. What's more, some of the best innovations don't lower costs and don't substitute capital for labor, which is the way that we became more productive in other industries. So I've been thinking that the whole equation around technology, eds and meds, needs to be rethought. That's why I recently did a TEDx talk on the campus here at Duke, and I did the faculty conversation that you watched uh, previously today. So what I'd like to do now is enter into some of the questions in the Q&A and also remind you that if you have questions while I'm talking, to jump in, tweet them to me at, at Aaron Chatterjee or the Fuqua alumni hashtag. So let's start with a few questions. So Jared Myers, and it's always good to see a familiar face, CCMBA 2011. Jared and I actually have worked together, like with many of you, outside the classroom. After finishing at CCMBA, or even maybe during the last term, we started talking about an independent study Jared was doing in South Africa. I was pleased to see that now Jared is working for the Dell Foundation in South Africa, which is an interesting connection because originally we were talking much more about uh, utilities and mining, and now we have a common interest in education. So Jared, your question was a good one. Jared's working on thinking about what are the barriers to educational technology interventions. He's working in South Africa, and it sounds like some work in India, and trying to understand what are the keys to implementing good ed tech projects. You see, Jared's identified a really important challenge, fidelity of implementation. 
to use Duke bas basketball lingo, some of these things seem like they should be slam dunks, but they end up not working at all. Let me give you a couple examples. So think about laptops in the classroom. Lots of universities and K through 12 institutions have put laptops in the classroom, thinking that they'll increase student outcomes. What's happened over the last several years is many schools have actually abandoned these laptop programs completely. Why? After all, isn't that an easy slam dunk technological fix? Give students laptops, allow them to be connected to the internet all the time, get them more engaged with their course material, be able to connect with one another to share ideas and ask new questions? It seems like an easy no-brainer. Turns out, though, dropping laptops into laps of high school students or junior high students or even college students isn't a recipe for success. And that's happened on the international arena with programs like One Laptop Per Child as well. The problem that they're finding in school districts around the US at least is that without carefully controlling the content, students don't always gravitate towards the things that are most educational. And I'll leave it to you to think about the other things they're doing with their laptops. On the same token, if the teachers aren't trained to actually integrate the laptops into the curriculum, you don't seem to get benefits. If the teacher has to stick to a very strict curriculum and get certain things done on certain days, it might be hard for him or her to bring the laptop and the technology into the classroom. And it turns out a lot of the low-cost interventions are ones that don't do that sales, service, and training that we need for teachers and administrators, much less students and parents. That's why a lot of academic studies of laptops in schools and other kinds of technology interventions have found that they don't work and they don't have good results, and a lot of schools are dropping them. So what are the keys to successful implementation? Jared, I'll be honest with you. I haven't cracked the code, and very few other people have, but I'll tell you a few things I think are really important. One is, I think it's understanding the workflow of the teacher in this case and the students. Too many of us, I think, in business are focused on disrupting institutions because they're inefficient, rather than really studying them and understanding what makes a great teacher great and what makes a great doctor or healthcare provider great. Understanding workflow and trying to build the tools that go along with that workflow and support them complementing the provider rather than substituting seems to be a good general philosophy. Let me make one other specific point. In some of the pilot studies I've done with educational technology, it turns out some of the old school metrics, things like engagement between the teachers and the students, actually seem to be good predictors of how successful technology is. Think about that for a second. Technology isn't substituting for the teacher-student relationship. In fact, a strong teacher-student relationship and an engaged teacher is actually helping technology work better. Those are some of the keys I've found through my research and exactly what I'd like to figure out through more work. I'm looking for that killer app the same way you are. And for those out there watching, if you have ideas about healthcare or educational applications that I should be looking at, that I should be studying, that I should be writing about them, tweet them to me at Aaron Chatterjee or the Fuqua alumni hashtag. I'd love to explore them and get to know them better. And in fact, if you have one going on in your company, I'll come out and visit you as well. So the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is validation. Because Jared, one of the problems you're having in your organization might be that we don't know which tools to adopt. That's why I started with the EduStar project that I mentioned in the video. Now, Mark Coleman from CCMBA 07 wanted to know how to get more information on EduStar. Mark, right now the program is being developed by CFY, CFY.org. It's a New York-based nonprofit organization that's in many, many schools and piping in content through their Power My Learning platform. We've asked them to implement the EduStar platform and test the effectiveness of new technologies. You can find more information on their website. A lot of it's under wraps now as we're continuing to develop the pilot, but we've raised several million dollars in philanthropic funding to actually develop EduStar. For those who didn't watch the video, let me give you a quick summary of what EduStar is about. My notion with my colleague Ben Jones at Northwestern was that we need a consumer reports for education technology. About 25% of parents have downloaded some sort of app for their kids, and teachers all over the United States and around the world are using apps in the classroom. Here's the problem. We don't know what works. Now, if you're a person who thinks the market will solve it all, and I agree with you in a lot of cases, here's why it might not work here. If we don't know what works, we might end up using the apps with the slickest marketing or the ones that are sold by the sales rep we already know. What happens to the disruptive innovator, the entrepreneur, without the sales force, without the connection, without the fancy marketing and glitzy materials? There could be great apps out there that actually improve student learning that you'll never hear about. So what we need is not more regulation or more free market. We actually need to shape the system through institutions like EduStar. EduStar is a consumer reports modeled platform that basically does randomized controlled trials on educational technologies. How do you do it? The same way Amazon and Google test different versions of their homepage. We go into schools using the network of CFY that I mentioned before, and we test apps head-to-head -to, -head to see what works and what doesn't. 
the schools that participate in the test will get some benefits as being part of this network of innovative schools and will use the results from the test to publish the results on an open website for parents, teachers, and students. Through public disclosure of what works and what doesn't, using experimental methods and not just hype, we can know which apps to download and which ones will actually bend the cost curve. It's those kind of institutions that I think we should be going for. Not disrupting the system by upending the student-teacher relationship. Not having heavy-handed government command and control regulation that mandates which technology we should use, but having disclosure of information and letting people make the choice what to adopt. So EduStar is one sort of step in that direction. So let me turn to a few other questions. And again, remind you, if you have questions on things I've talked about so far or comments or reactions, send them my way. You can always communicate with me, too, after the session as I'll be continuing to work on these topics over the next couple of years. So, there's obviously a big public sector and political component to that. And for the students watching from the United States, many of you have been reading the front pages for the last several years as we debate issues around healthcare and to a lesser extent education. While I didn't set out to write a controversial piece in the New York Times or give a TEDx talk that would lead to political backlash, clearly right, these, 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 these problems and solutions have a political and policy angle. What I love about business school and the MBA experience though is that most of us, almost all of us, are focused on practical solutions. When I would talk about these issues with MBA students or fellow professors, I was struck by the common thread that we all want to find solutions. In most cases, we didn't have a partisan or ideological view on it. We wanted to find out what works. And when I talk to business people who are venturing into education and healthcare, they often are frustrated by the bureaucracy and inefficiency of government. We don't understand why we spend so much on things that don't work. So I'm very hopeful that in writing on this topic and continuing to do more projects, that I can come to non-ideological and non-partisan solutions that a lot of people can get behind to reform our education and healthcare system. But of course, you're always going to have to get into these issues. So let me talk about some of those solutions in a second. You know, from the MBA perspective, spending money and not getting a return on investment is a really frustrating thing. And what I see in our education system and our healthcare system is exactly that. We're spending money on putting smart boards in classrooms without knowing if students actually learn because smart boards are there. Careful studies haven't been done. We haven't figured out what works and what doesn't. And a lot of smart boards aren't used up to their capabilities. Now, smart boards could be a great investment, but we need to know. And I think as a person coming from the business angle, if we don't know and have the data on the return on investment, we often have inefficiencies. It's the same thing in healthcare. Think about readmissions into the hospital. It used to be that 20% of elderly patients, one out of five, when they were uh, discharged from the hospital, they were readmitted within 30 days. Why is that happening? Well, in the past, we used to just reimburse and pay the hospital for readmitting the patient again. The incentives weren't aligned. Now, that was inefficient and led to a lot of waste. Now, under the Affordable Care Act here in the United States, there's going to be penalties for those avoidable readmissions. So from a business leader standpoint, from a pragmatic lens, from a cost-benefit analysis, there are so many things we can do in our education healthcare system before we even get into political debates about charter schools and teachers' unions and Obamacare and death panels. That's the part of the equation that I'd like to focus on because I think there's a lot of traction we can make. Now, talking about some of the political angles here for a second, Joe Carter, uh, Gemba 2010. Joe, I remember you. You used to sit in the front row of my class and ask me very tough questions. Joe's not sitting in the room today, but he's continuing to ask tough questions, okay? And I appreciate you for it. Basically, Joe is asking his question, look, Ronnie, both parties stand in the way of all these great reforms we could have in education and healthcare. It's not a political thing, but the politics seems to get in the way at every point. How can we hope for innovation in a world where the government is so involved in education and healthcare? And he specifically references the White House experience as maybe something I could bring to bear here. So Joe, I think it's a great question, and some of it does depend on political viewpoints. But let me tell you some of the things I've seen from sort of a more nonpartisan lens. I've seen the government at all levels, including public and private partnerships, can play a pretty useful role in setting standards and setting the foundation on which others can build. That's one of the great powers of government. If you ask most economists, they'll think um, investments in things like basic research or setting technical standards are far superior to heavy-handed interventions like funding specific companies. And that's generally my view as well and what I thought about in the government. I think that using the government to convene stakeholders and rally people around common cause is another really important thing. At the White House, when you call, people usually tended to call back and want to show up for an event. And I think that's another important power that you have uh, in the government at the federal and state level. I think what we have to be really careful of, though, is government decision makers picking standards or picking winners without thinking of the implications. That's happened a lot in the U.S. and other countries, and it often leads to inefficiency. So I, at least my perspective is some of the things we can do are more table setting, things that won't show up in the newspaper or aren't that sexy, but are really, really important for making sure education and healthcare systems work well. 
Let me give you a few examples of programs that have bipartisan support. So Joe, one of those programs is Race to the Top. It's a multi-billion dollar prize program that President Obama used to fund education. Here's the idea. Rather than mandating standards or telling people what to do, they offered prize money to states that adopted evidence-based standards in their education system. These are things related to teacher pay or charter schools or classroom size. These are things that came out of research that have been validated. The states and the school districts competed for the money in a way that led to a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. In the end, the award winners were announced, but several other states and school districts ended up adopting reforms. So at the end, what we see there is a virtuous cycle where the government can provide incentives, prizes that don't necessarily orient companies or states or school districts to a particular answer, but help them along the way. And that's how I think we should think about it. Edustar is another great example of that, right? I don't think Edustar is about regulating apps. It's about information disclosure on a free website. Those are the kinds of things we can do, I think, to shape the system rather than disrupt it. I think there's a careful balance that you know, every country in the industrialized world is struggling with, with their education and healthcare system. There will continue, I think, to be a huge government role in education and healthcare just because of historical legacy, whether it's at the federal or state level. The question is that creative tension between the public, private, and nonprofit sector. So that's how I think about that one. So as more questions are, are coming across, I can, uh, I can answer some of these. So, and this is great because I know a few more of the students here. Both Richard Embry and Itai are students I know pretty well and have a lot of uh, experience in healthcare specifically. So, Rich, um, your question is how might technology help decrease healthcare costs, especially when we think about overutilization? It's a great question. So, let's talk about um, one of the most exciting spaces out there right now, which is wearable devices. Hold up your hand at home if you have a Fitbit on. I haven't been using the Fitbit, partly because of the battery life and also my concerns about the accuracy of measurement but most of my friends are using the Fitbit or another wearable technology. Now there's so much innovation in this hardware space and we're gonna see even more when Google and Apple and other big providers develop this hardware. But here's the question, are these consumer facing apps that will help people like me who have a relatively good understanding of calories and fat and are monitoring their own health closely or are they gonna be oriented towards the clinical setting, the type that Rich and others might be working in? That's the big million dollar question for me. It's one thing to give people who are already very concerned about their health and very knowledgeable about health and fitness more tools to do so. That's an amazing consumer market. On the other hand, to really make a dent on the clinical side, I think the technologies need to look a little bit different. Think about all the companies that are handing out tablets to Medicare patients, hoping that they're gonna be able to monitor their health. Well, I have news for you. If you've worked with most of the patients that are getting readmitted under the Medicare program, a lot of them aren't going to be able to use tablets the way we might think. In addition, unless the wearable device is something that doesn't need to be charged very frequently and it's easy to use, it's going to be very, very hard to get good data back. We need to start with the very basics, and that's why I think a lot of the home health visits and nurses' calls are what a lot of hospital systems are going for. Technology can make a big dent, but just remember that in different parts of the population, technology intervention can be easier or harder. I see a lot of promise on the consumer wearable size for specific parts of the population, but if you want to make a dent in our healthcare system, in our healthcare spending, we're talking about programs like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security too, which might be a little bit more difficult to make a dent in. We need to think about the killer apps in those settings. And here's the secret, it might not be an app, it might be a person. Now, Itai, uh, who I have this past year in daytime, uh, has worked extensively with medical device companies in the U.S. and Israel. Now, here it is. Itai is asking if we can share our thoughts on the government disruption in innovation and ways the government can mitigate it. So here's the idea. There are a lot of people inside government who are trying to disrupt the system. They're making data more open and available through things like data jams and startup weekends. There's one in North Carolina coming up in just a few weeks. So policymakers recognize they have to get out of their silos and work with entrepreneurs and innovators. One of the things I did at the White House more than anything else was meet with business people, meet with entrepreneurs. At the same time, I think government has limitations. Because of its size, because of the number of permissions you need to get, it's sometimes hard to execute. And that's where the business side can be really useful. So I think public policy is going to be a huge, huge impediment for some innovations in healthcare. But slowly and surely, you're seeing some opportunities in healthcare created by new regulations and maybe in some cases deregulation. Think about readmissions, for example. I talked about it earlier. There's a revolving door in many hospitals where patients are coming back in for readmissions after being in the hospital. Here's the thing, now we have penalties that are gonna make it much more financially difficult for hospitals to continue to do that. With hospitals operating at pretty thin profit margins in many parts of the country, those readmission penalties are gonna to start to add up. 
here's the space for a company to come up with ways, cost-efficient ways, to help hospitals reduce readmissions. That's an opportunity created by new regulations, or deregulations if you prefer, and that's a way entrepreneurial startups can get into the game. There's always going to be this back and forth in this country between government and the private sector when it comes to healthcare and education. I do see lots of opportunities emerging, though there are lots of impediments too we're going to need to navigate. Let me turn to a few more uh, questions that came up earlier. One thing I want to talk about is um, the budgetary aspect. So one of the things that struck me in Washington, D.C., and, and DJ, DJ Vo, uh, who is a daytime 01 student, asked about this, is the federal budget uh, is a mess. And when you think about that, you wonder what are driving the costs in our federal budget? You know, if you listen to the political chatter, uh, there's a lot of misinformation about that. It's not food stamps or veteran benefits or foreign aid. Really, a lot of our budget is spent on things like national defense and health care. And so if you look at health care specifically, bending the cost curve in health care, trying to figure out how to spend less and get more, is going to be a really important part about solving our fiscal challenges as well. And that's one of the reasons as an economist that I want to focus on that topic. At the state level, which DJ asks about specifically, it's also an education story. You know, as much as you might hear about the federal government role in education and Department of Education, most of the action is in Raleigh and Richmond and other state capitals when it comes to education. In fact, in North Carolina, about 77% of our budget is spent on education or health care in some form or fashion. But there are other obligations that the state needs to take care of that might crowd out those spending. Think about public pensions, which is what DJ asked specifically. So DJ, about 7 to 10%, depending on the state, is now going to these pensions for state workers. And until we reform some of those pensions, and you know, some states are in better conditions than others, that's going to squeeze out spending for things like education and health care. There's really only two solutions, spend less, or grow the pie through increasing taxes or growing the economy. I mean, and if you look at this, increasing taxes is a non-starter in many states due to political situations, and growing the state economy has been hard to come by since the Great Recession. So what's happened is about 34 out of 50 states have cut education spending since 2013, and 2000, or since the 2008 recession. So if you look at the school year, we have 34 to 50 states who have made cuts. For parents, for teachers, for students, we have to figure out if those cuts are going to be consistent with getting better outcomes in education. Because the other side of the equation is that we're falling behind on international tests. As was so nicely done in the graphics in the video, the U.S. is falling behind on international examinations in math, in science, and in technology. If we're going to be spending less in education at the state level, how are we going to get more out of our students? And that's really the puzzle that a lot of state regulators and policymakers are thinking about. One idea people have thought about in North Carolina and other states are virtual schools or using massive open, open online courses as a model. This is the kind of killer app that I worry more about. If you put students in front of a computer without a lot of guidance, I worry that we're going to have the same problem that we have with the laptops in school districts around the country. Without a teacher who's guiding them through the material, helping identify trouble spots, I worry that a lot of the value of education is going to be lost. MOOCs are fantastic for picking up new skills or augmenting things in the classroom, but they often have pretty low completion rates, and students don't always perform well on the competency exams that are at the end of the MOOC. So I think for some, self-directed learning can be really good, but as a substitute to our conventional education, I've yet to see the data that can work. While these type of innovations are important to develop and see what works and what doesn't, I have a feeling the killer app is going to involve more of the teacher in the classroom plus an innovative technology. And that might not necessarily save a lot of money. Think about the teacher's aide who needs to be managing the technology. Think about the scribe who's helping the doctor with the electronic medical record. Substituting technology for labor isn't going to be as easy in education and health, and that's going to have a huge impact on our potential to bend the cost curve as well. So as we think about, and keep, keep sending me questions as we go on, i just like to also open it up to, to crowdsource ideas from the Fuqua alumni and people watching this video. For my, in my estimation, the future of education and health care is going to determine the health and prosperity of the United States of America. And because I care about that issue at a high level, I want to figure out ways to crack the code for ed and meds. I hear a lot of talk out there about replacing teachers with tablets and doctors with wearable technologies. And I just wonder whether we should be thinking about it in a different way. While it's exciting to attend panel discussions and talk about disrupting systems or working around systems, I worry that true reform can't be happening unless we really engage with teachers, doctors, and other providers. I talk to a lot of educational entrepreneurs these days. Some of them are frustrated working within the system, and I understand that. It's really hard to get things done. It's really hard to navigate the bureaucracy and get permissions to even implement the technologies, much less test them. Many of them have thought about innovating around the system, working for the after-school market or tutoring. Those can be great test beds for new ideas, but you're never really going to impact, I think, the entire education picture unless you work in the belly of the beast, unless you work in where the 90% of, of students go, which is public schools. 
while it might be more frustrating to do that, I think at the end the impact is going to be a lot larger, even if you test your ideas in tutoring and after school markets to start. In healthcare, I see a similar thing. A lot of folks want to work around the system. Think about things like concierge medicine, or even oriented towards people who are paying out of pocket. While a lot of innovation can happen on the fringes, again, for the tens of millions of people who are actually in the healthcare system, you're going to miss a lot of that if you work around it. So I encourage you as entrepreneurs and innovators out there, yes, test your ideas where you can get a foothold, but never lose sight of where the problems are and where the solutions need to be implemented. And that, I think, is in the bellies of the beast in education and healthcare. The other thing I wanted to address a little bit is, if you have technology success stories out there, models that have really worked, please tweet them to me at, at Aaron Chatterjee, or you can also put them on the Fuqua alumni hashtag. I'm really interested in finding those success stories. We're not trying to be Luddites here. The Luddites were those uh, Industrial Revolution era uh, British workers who smashed the machines in response to new technology. Technology is a good thing. It's delivered so much value in so many different areas. The issue here is figuring out what the right technology is, what, which technology will actually work to deliver value in education and healthcare. And there are great examples out there. And so if you have examples of those, please send them my way. Let me tell you about one that I, I talked a little bit on the pre-recorded video. WellDoc. WellDoc has a Blue Star diabetes application that helps to, uh, patients manage their blood glucose levels. As people in medicine and healthcare know, managing your blood sugar levels is a really difficult thing, and there's been lots of innovations over time to help uh, diabetes patients. WellDoc's app is targeted at type 2 diabetes specifically. What's really cool about WellDoc is they don't just have an app that you can download off the uh, Apple Store and use on the consumer market. They actually got approval by the FDA doing a clinical trial. Now that might sound crazy if you're in consumer electronics. Why would you spend the time working with the FDA, a government institution that's going to make you jump through a lot of hoops to get approval? Well, the answer is, now that WellDoc has FDA approval, now that they have the clinical evidence to back it up, a lot more people are going to want to adopt it. In fact, it'll now become something that the doctor can prescribe. You see, when the audience is teachers and doctors and parents, it's going to turn out that evidence might be a benefit not as much of a cause as you might think. So for apps like WellDoc's Blue Star, it turns out running the clinical trial and producing evidence was one of the keys to their early success. Now that's not going to be true for every kind of app. If you're in a company that's developing a consumer electronic and you have to deal with product life cycles that are 6 to 12 months, it's going to be hard to get FDA approval for that. But think about two tiers of the market. One for the consumer electronic that I'm going to replace in 6 months, and the other for the sustainable business model that's actually going to improve patient life or educational outcomes. That's the part of the equation that I'm especially interested in. So if you have examples of that, please send them my way. Now, some of the things I've been thinking about as I work on uh, materials for this is how these lessons might generalize to the rest of the world. You know, Jared uh, Myers, who brought this up in South Africa, talked about this specifically. You know, in South Africa, in India, in China, there's lots of technological interventions to try to improve education and health. In many cases, these are things that are built off the United States experience, but in other cases, they're the perfect examples of reverse innovation that's championed by Jeff Immel and the team at GE. The reverse innovation ideas probably have a lot more promise because they're organic and endemic to the emerging market. So be skeptical, I think, as a first order problem of basically just porting solutions from the US to other parts of the world. In general, that's not going to work very well. But even technological interventions that are built with context might not always be successful for the same reasons that I'm talking about today. Fidelity of implementation is going to be a huge deal. You know, the One Laptop Per Child program has had a lot of success, but also got a lot of criticism. One of the criticisms that it's got is this notion of drive-by implementation. We can't just drop off the laptops in a classroom in the US, in South Africa, or India and expect a certain outcome. There's a lot of training that has to go with it. And there's a lot of curriculum reform that has to go with it as well. Teachers, doctors, other providers are busy. And working into their system with technology isn't always going to work, even if the app works well. So if you're at home and you're designing um, a killer app for the social entrepreneurial space, you have to think about these use cases as well. Getting outside the building, using the lean startup approach, and talking to the client and the target is going to be incredibly important in that. So whether you're doing this in the international or the domestic space in the US, I think these kind of lessons are going to be incredibly important. You know, the healthcare systems often uh, is another point of contention as we think about around the world. In most parts of the world, you have a big government role for healthcare, but the way the government operates in healthcare is much different. So some of the things I've been writing about and thinking about might be translated in other settings. Others might not be. For example, the Affordable Care Act has expanded insurance to many Americans, expanded the Medicaid program, and built a private system where people can buy insurance on online exchanges. In other parts of the world, the insurance system works much differently. It's closer to single payer, and the doctors are employed by the government. 
in these different settings, there'll be different use cases for technology and what works and what doesn't. In my mind, the U.S. is an especially fertile ground to try these innovations, but it doesn't mean it can't be tried in other places. So if you're one of my many students from the global program, the cross-continent or daytime program, who's in another part of the world working on these issues, I hope these insights are going to be useful to you as well. Now, in my last 10 minutes, I want to just again reiterate, if there are questions for me, you can tweet at, at Aaron Chatterjee or the Fuqua alumni hashtag. I'm looking forward as I continue to work on these topics to get more of your feedback and more of your advice. I also want to talk a little bit about how I think education here at Fuqua can be changed to reflect these ideas. So in the last 10 minutes, feel free to interrupt me and send me questions, but I'll close with how I think Fuqua should adjust to these challenges. And maybe as alumni, you can get involved and help us do more in this area as well. The first thing is thinking about education. One of the most surprising things to me is how many students are coming back to Fuqua with interest in education. A generation ago, most people coming to business school were looking for jobs in consulting or finance, and that's where we sent them. But things start to change. Health sector became a really important part of the curriculum. In the past, health sector management programs were in schools of public health or even medical schools. But increasingly, you see these following the Fuqua example in the business school. We have built these successful health management programs, and people like David Ridley and Kevin Schulman are a huge part of that. Why? Because it turns out the nexus between business and health can be talked about at Fuqua as well as anywhere else on campus. I think education might go under a similar transformation. You know, Duke doesn't have a school of education, but there's a very good one down the road at the University of North Carolina. It turns out, though, because of that space on campus, some of these issues might not be getting discussed as much as they should. So when I see Fuqua students coming back interested in education, when I see my alumni reaching out in education, I think there's a lot of opportunity for Fuqua to make big waves here. It's not just through the Net Impact Club and extracurricular activities, it's also in the form of centers and other initiatives. It might not be crazy to think about an education and business initiative here at Fuqua one day. And if you're an alumni who's interested in that, we should reach out and talk about it. You see, the business of education and thinking about how to drive innovation in education is something that the business school is uniquely positioned to contribute to. And because those conversations might not be organically happening in other parts of campus, we have a special responsibility to do it as well. So if you're interested in ed tech, I think the place to start might be in business schools. And if you're here at Fuqua or you're connected with the alumni, tweet, send me an email, let me know what classes we should be offering, what initiatives we should be doing, and what speakers we should be having. I think there's a huge opportunity to do more on education here at Fuqua, evidenced by the students. Now healthcare is the other piece of the equation. What's really interesting to me is we've always, since I've been here, had a strong student interest in health. I think around 20% of our students concentrate in HSM and get the certificate. Because there's so many changes going around right now in the U.S. healthcare system, I've seen a lot of uncertainty and flux. As students go to big medical device or pharmaceutical companies, there's uncertainty about what those businesses are going to look like in the future, but also opportunities. One thing I've been thinking about based on my government experience is how we help our students deal with that uncertainty. The week in Washington is one way that we do that by taking our students up there to meet with policymakers to learn about new trends. But for things like FDA and regulating medical devices and new mobile apps, it's really hard to keep current when things are changing almost every day or every week. So I'm looking for innovative models to help communicate the latest information that's going on in Washington or Raleigh or Richmond to our students to help them as they go through their careers. You can help me by that. Uh, by emailing me or tweeting different things that are going on in the regulatory space. I want to keep our students current so they can understand the changing landscape of innovation. I don't want their time to be in business school to be just about the classes. I also want them to be engaging with the environment. For healthcare in the U.S., this is an especially opportune time to do that because so many things are changing and the system is in flux. And as our students who are graduating this year, next year, or have in recent years, I also want dispatches from the field. Let me know how things are going, how you're navigating the post-Affordable Care Act landscape, and some business lessons you might have learned in that regard. These will all be things that will help me as I develop more content for my own writings, whether it's books or articles, op-eds, research articles, or we develop programs at Fuqua. Those things are all going to be very useful. In general, I think there's been a shift in business schools towards thinking about the big challenges. As I said, in the 1970s and 80s, business schools were much more vocational and practitioner oriented. Now, business schools seem to be the place on campus where the big issues are discussed. And that's really you, the students who are driving it. Idealistic students who want to change the world, not just change a business, have been coming back to Fuqua for a long time. You come and inform the curriculum and tell the professors that this is what you're interested in. And you've been changing Fuqua. And one of the really interesting things, I think, is the size of the Net Impact Club, the size of the Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Club. As these two sort of clubs represent emerging student interest, I think that's tracking what's happening to MBA students here in the U.S. and around the world. 
So these are things we can change at Fuqua as we go forward, and we need to build on them. I think we have a comparative advantage here at Fuqua and students who are passionate about policy issues and trying to solve them with a business mindset. I think we can continue to build on that, and the alumni network can be a big part of that. Now, as I have about five minutes left, I just want to remind you, any further questions, send them my way, email me, tweet. If we sign off in five minutes and you still have more questions, let me know, and I'll continue to respond over email and Twitter. As I told the folks here at Fuqua, I've just started using Twitter and uh, really enjoyed it. So please follow me. Send me different things that you're thinking about. It'll help me uh, engage and not feel so old, like I'm out of touch with all, what all the kids are using. So to close with the last five minutes, let me, think, uh, let me just talk a little bit about where I think US policy on these two areas is going and kind of what we can look to for the future. So if you think about these topics on education and healthcare, we have sort of this really vexing problem. We want to spend less, but we want to get more. Technology is going to be one way to do it, but I think if we just apply technology haphazardly, without data collection, without evidence, we're going to be spinning our wheels. My hope is that in the next several years, we're going to come up with ways to shape the system, to deliver good evidence on apps like the WellDoc Blue Star or things that might come through EduStar, and figure out what works and then scale them. For business people, the question is, what works and how do I build on it? I feel like some of these institutions might be able to help shape that debate and make it better. Now in the end, if you hate politics and policy, if you think it's all messy, as I often do, you're going to be reluctant to get involved in that. Many of these decisions have to be made by governments and have to come through a political process. And it's hard to sometimes imagine our politicians in the U.S. agreeing on anything. But one thing that surprised me a lot in Washington was this. Number one, behind closed doors, there's a lot more agreement than you might think. Sometimes the political dynamics shift very quickly, and you've seen that in several different debates between Democrats, Republicans, and across independents recently. Second, even when things, uh, uh, time seem like we'll never get anything done, sometimes things actually do get done. When I was in 2010, I was at the White House. This was at the height of a lot of the partisan bickering between Democrats and Republicans. We entered the lame duck session. The lame duck session is where the politicians who have lost their races or retired are now spending their last session in Congress and about to leave. Clearly, the incentives to do much are weakened. A seasoned political pro told me, Ronnie, nothing ever happens during the lame duck session. So don't inspect any progress on this important food safety bill, on anything with reforming the military, with don't ask, don't tell, any of these big issues that were on the agenda. But something really amazing happened. Despite all the experts, despite all the wisdom, despite all the people who said there was gridlock, a ton happened during that lame duck session. In fact, it was probably one of the most productive times in my period of Washington. There was a food, food safety bill. There was a repeal of don't ask, don't tell, and big changes in the military. All these initiatives have been percolating under the surface for a long time came to the fore. And whether you agree with them or not, right, the, the action was in the forward direction during that session when people said there would be gridlock. You might be looking at our political system now and saying, look, nothing's ever going to happen. We're going to continue to move sideways on education and health care. Budgets are going to get cut. Inefficiencies are not going to get trimmed, and technology is going to be implemented haphazard. You might not have hope that things are going to change. I think you shouldn't be so pessimistic. A lot of things have happened over the last several years when we expected them not to happen. And political elections, dynamics change so quickly and create space for people to collaborate and come up with new ideas. So whether it's this administration and Republicans in Congress, a future Republican president and Democratic Congress, there's lots of common ground, I think, where people can come to solutions on education and health care in non-ideological, non-partisan ways. There's also an important role for business leaders in all of this. One of the most trusted advisors for both Democrats and Republicans in DC are the business community. They rely on you to provide them unbiased advice about what's actually happening in the economy. And so you can tell them which things are working and which aren't, which regulations are onerous and which are actually helping, and what are the important priorities. So I encourage you, if not getting involved in the political system, at least keep in touch with your representatives and senators and congressmen and everyone else around these issues with education and health care. The, the only way these things are going to change is if we get a strong business voice and community voice on them. So as business leaders, you might be more powerful than you think to shape these issues. My conviction is that the future of ed and meds is going to be a lot brighter. We're going to do better in education and get higher outcomes. We're going to do better in science, technology, engineering, and math. We're going to use the right technologies. We're going to implement them in the right place, and we're going to keep the student-teacher relationship strong. In healthcare, I also see a lot of room for promise. Forget all the controversy over Obamacare right now and think 10 to 15 years. We've really made reforms in our delivery system. More personal monitoring of health is being integrated into the system. I think we can make great strides there as well. It might not seem like it's possible in the early to short term, but I think over the long term, there's a lot of promise there as well. So 
with that, I just would like to conclude and thank a few people. First, I want to thank Katie and the entire alumni team for putting on this great event. I also want to thank Matthew Duckworth, the entire multimedia team, for producing that super slick video that I'm sending out to all my friends and relatives. I also want to tee up the next session with Michael Brandt of the finance area, who will be speaking at the next Google Faculty Conversation. And I hope you will join us for that one and keep in touch with me on Twitter and over email. To all the alumni out there, thanks so much for listening. See you soon.